Hello, Giants fans, and welcome to the Valentine's Views Podcast. I'm your host, Ed Valentine of Big Blue View. Please remember to uh, subscribe to Big Blue View Radio, whether you're uh, watching on YouTube or whether you're listening across the Big Blue View Radio Network, wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, you know, Giants fans, one of the uh, one of the things that I would like to do as we fill up some time this summer is uh, is help you guys get to know some of the the contributors at Big Blue View. You guys know Chris Flum, you guys know Nick Filato from their writing and from the podcast work that they that they do. You also know Tony Del Genio from uh, from his writing and some of the shows that that he's done with me. And today I have one of our newer contributors with me on on the show. I have Rivka Board and Rivka Thank you for hopping on, and uh, welcome to the show, and uh, a belated welcome to Big Blue View as well. Well, thank you for having me, and I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to write for Big Blue View and to cover the Giants. So you came on, was it April, I think you came on, Steph? And we have to to start here. um, In terms of telling people, you know, what your background is, you are writing for a Jets site and a Mets site. And uh, I don't know about, I don't know about big blue view readers and listeners and baseball, but, but Jets and Mets is two strikes. I don't know. I'm sorry, (laughs) but just, yeah, just tell folks, you know, how that came about and, uh, and a little bit about your background. Okay. So um, I've been a football fan since I was nine. I mean, really since I was five years old, but nine was when I started following full time. Um, My mother's father is a huge Jets fan and he got to me first in sports. So (laughs) he, you know, he taught me everything, you know, he taught me football and taught me about the Jets. So that was going to be the team I was going to root for. The thing is, when I was nine, I discovered that my father's a giant fan. So and not only is he a giant fan, but uh, he has six brothers and five of them are also giant fans. One of them's a cowboy fan. So I'll ask Giants fans, which one's worse, Jets or Cowboys? Oh, there's, there's, there's always a black sheep. There's always a black sheep. You know, my, I, I will tell you quickly, my, I have two sons and my youngest son decided during the 2007 Giants Super Bowl, he decided that if he was going to sit down and watch the game, it was Giants Patriots, of course, he decided if he was going to sit down and watch the game, he was going to sit there and annoy me. <laughs> Or he was going to root for the Patriots, and to this day he still roots for the Patriots. Oh wow! So, so I have to live with, I have to deal with that. So, I, so I get it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so then you know, so he's a, my father's a Giant fan, and the thing is, this was um, 2005, so I guess I was 10 then. But the Jets were so bad that year; they were four and 12. Uh, Chad Pennington got hurt. Everything went so bad that I said, you know what? My father's a Giant fan. Let's go watch the Giants too. <laughs> so um, I started watching the Giants that year, rooted for them really hard, saw them lose 23-0 to Carolina. Now, I watched that game with my grandfather, who's a huge Jet fan and does not like the Giants. And for most of the years that I watched Giants games, I watched them with my grandfather. So I dealt with the reverse of what you did, which is I'm rooting for the Giants and he's rooting, he's rooting against them. Um, but I stayed a fan of both teams and it's really, it's not the same thing as like, let's say in hockey where you have the Rangers devils and and Islanders in the same division, or you have the, the nets and the Knicks. These are teams that play each other once every four years. I understand that there's a rivalry going back, you know, and, and it's about supremacy in New York, but if you sort of put that all out of the way, as long as people are not like actively, you know, getting on each other's case about it, they don't really have that much to do with each other. So it's not really that complicated. Now, 2023 is going to be complicated because they play each other. So I'm going to be covering the Jets and the Giants and uh, writing about the weaknesses, the strengths and weaknesses of each team for the other one. But for the most part, it, they don't, there's not a lot of overlap. So it, it works. Um, you know, and in terms of yeah. what you said about Giants and Mets, my father and all his brothers are Mets fans. So they're yeah. Giants, Mets. And it, believe it or not, my sister once posted in a Mets Twitter community asking, um, if people are jet, more Jets fans or Giants fans, and then the, the thousand responses she got, there were more Giants responses. Interesting, because I, I guess I, I think of it as maybe because it's it's the way that I think. I think of it as Giants, Yankees, and Mets, Jets. But so I always thought of it that way. Mets for me makes sense. Giants or Jets, I could see it either way. What doesn't mm-hmm. make sense to me is Yankees and Jets. 
it's just like if you're a Yankee fan, you like that, you know, organization that has this history of, you know, winning big and spending big. And then you're a Jets fan. It just, just doesn't compute to me. Yeah. So so I'm I'm curious, though, since you came on at Big Blue View, have you uh, have you had to explain yourself to some of your Jets readers? Uh, no, actually, I guess none of them really know that I'm doing this. The extent that I get is when I on the Mets site, sometimes I get readers asking me about the Jets or the Giants. I do get oh. that in the same thread sometimes, same comments on the same article asking me about mm-hmm. Jets or Giants. But um, I, Jet X, I guess they don't pay much attention, just like on the Giants site. I mean, I happen to have told everyone that I'm that I'm a Jets fan, but eh, no one no one really cares too much. And I'm curious how you gravitated to how you gravitated to sports writing. So, you know, it's funny. I look back at it now and I say, I wish I had gotten into it much sooner. Um, I, you know, I always had opinions about sports and I would always, you know, every time we had a family event or anything, my, my family members would always come over and ask me, you know, questions and discuss things with me. Um, when I was younger, it was more traditional statistics, but, but still conversations and debates. And I've, I've liked to write for a long time. So then finally, a year, about a year and a half ago, I took a course in, sport, in football analytics from Aaron Schatz and Mike Tanier at Football Outsiders. And I was talking to Aaron afterward about the possibility of working in sports. And he, he, you know, he was telling me different things and he was saying it's not easy to get, get into it full time. But he said, if you want to if you want to get started, go and try to write for, a fa- you know, a blog or a fan site or something. So I just applied to some jet sites you know, got accepted at Jets X Factor and started writing. Then I realized afterward that it wasn't just a fan site, that it was a little bit, you know, it's run by someone with credentials with the team. So that's how I got my start. And once mm-hmm. I was doing it for the Jets, I realized that with all my my relatives on my father, my father's side, my cousins and everything, they're all big Giants fans and they wouldn't, but they couldn't read my content because they don't really follow the Jets. So I said, mm-hmm. let's get into the Giants too, because I like, I, I, you know, I follow them too. I know a lot about them. Let me mm-hmm. let me cover them also. And you have a uh, you love the analytical stuff. You love the numbers and all of that. And and uh, why don't you tell folks you know wh- where that love comes from and and what your background is with you know with all the analytics and and that kind of stuff. Okay, so I was actually before before this year I was a public school ma- high school math teacher for six years. So you know numbers have always been my thing. In term, you know, as I said, when I was younger, I hate was, math. I hate math. I hate math. I hate that, math. That, that's you and ninety nine percent of the people I meet. You know, I'm not teaching it anymore for better or for worse. <laughs> so I, uh, I, um, there's a I reason why I'm a writer. I hate math. <laughs> well, but, I'm a writer who loves math. But now that I've thoroughly distracted you, go back to go, yeah. go ahead. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I taught, I taught math as a kid, you know, I didn't have so much access to let's say advanced um, writing. I, most of what I knew came from watching or from the paper. Um, I used to pour over the stats. I knew like every single player. I, I used to know the backup play, like the double backups on teams, even with getting all my information from the newspaper. So, um, and then as I got a little older, you know, you start hearing about all these terms and you just wonder like, what, you know, what is that and what relevance does that have? So really a few years ago, um, I started looking a little bit more into, you know, what are the, what's behind this? Like this game that I love, I, I was very frustrated originally when the game became such a, such a passing league, right? I liked the, you know, from my youth, run, you know, running the ball to set up a pass, defense, um, you know, very, very traditional in that way. And then when the league opened up, I wondered like, why is this? Is it just for the fans and just to make it more exciting? And so I started, you know, looking into the data a little bit more to try to understand why are some of these trends shifting in the NFL? Is it really true that going for it on fourth down should be done a lot more than it than it actually was at the time, for sure? Uh, Things like that. And so it just became, you know, an interest and it's still it's still a growing one. And there's there's definitely there's always more to learn and more to more to access, you know, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of the information regarding analytics is proprietary. So right now it's very hard to get access to the, all the data that you want. Sometimes you have to sort of try to, you know, create it on your own to a certain extent, or at least figure things out. But that's what makes it so cool is that it's a developing field. Yeah. I think it's, uh, although the giants are leaning into it more and more when you listen to, to Joe Shane talk about, analytics and the and the data that they have i think baseball 
is way ahead of football in terms of using the analytics and all of that. And, you know, as a baseball fan, there's, I, I understand the analytics, but there's part of me that's like, can we just play and can we let the manager actually use his brain once in a while instead of referring to the numbers? I almost think that, you know, and I'm sure you've heard this before, but to me, the, the analytics is nice, but sometimes you have to let football people think football and make decisions. And I think sometimes we get beholden to the, to the data. I mean, I, I don't know how you feel about that, you know, as you watch these sports unfold. So it's interesting because I told you I was going to read the book Caponomics, um, uh, you know, just about, you know, the, the salary cap to learn more about it. I, you know, I'm, I'm making my way through it. But one of the things that it says pretty early is forget which offhand, which um, I think it was from the Cleveland Browns. It was one of their maybe their G, one of their GMs or something had said that the ideal split in football is 60 percent analytics, 40 percent film. So he said, you, you just lean slightly on the numbers, but not just film, but meaning film, coaching, um, what you see on the practice, you know, practice field, what you see from the players, things like that. So what he's saying is you want to put an emphasis on analytics and maybe give it primacy, but not make it overwhelm everything else. Meaning you, you still have to let football people be football people. The, you know, the exact ratio we could debate, you know, which one should come first, which one is more important. I would like to think that they should be more 50 50 and that mm -hmm. you need to you need to use analytics more, I think, to set up. I think I think to maybe to set up the structure of what you're looking for in your, org in your organization and what's the most efficient system to run. You might want to go with analytics, but then in terms of the players that you bring in, you want to go with players who fit your system, not necessarily you know, just the, the raw numbers or the combine stats, certainly. Yeah, I think I think the thing that, that you know, as an old school guy, you know, as a guy who, who's been watching sports since before there were all of these analytics, I get the value, but there is, there is also a, to me, there's a human element. There is a game situation. There is a... You know, what's going on with the guys on the sideline? There's, you know, is the guy hurt? Is he, you know, is he 100%? There's, you know, when you're watching a pitcher, it's like he's thrown 92 pitches, but he's, you know, but he's throwing the ball great. And he's better than the guy in the bullpen that the analytics say I'm supposed to bring in right now. So, you know, to me, there, there's a human element that the numbers just can't really that they can't they can't quantify so that's that's why i i wish to me sometimes it feels too heavy going toward the analytics side so i think every organization has its own mix it's also in terms of where they use it some some teams really use the analytics mainly you know for the draft and for uh, free agency and the cap i think actually across the nfl that's the most common use of analytics is just in terms of figuring out how to manage your salary cap in the most efficient way possible. Um, into the particular analogy you gave with the pitcher, one thing to keep in mind is that they're also trying, there is a lot of evidence that when a pitcher goes past a hundred pitches, um, that's when the injuries start. So it, that's mm -hmm. something that is something to keep in mind. But as far as, as football is concerned, you know, it, I definitely think there's a feel, but I always go back to something that I saw in the Super Bowl that I, at the time, not even having looked at the analytics, I said, I'm telling you that this was the wrong decision. When the, you know, the Eagles were down, I think 28 to 27, they have fourth and two from their own, maybe 32 yard line, something like that, 32, 38, whatever it was mm -hmm. in the thirties. And, you know, the most, the most aggressive coach the entire year on going for it on fourth, fourth down. You know, Football Outsiders pu publishes a list of, you know, the aggressiveness index, they call it, based on, you know, game situation and how often coaches went for it compared to their peers. Nick Sirianni was the most aggressive coach in the NFL on fourth down last year. And yet in this situation where, as it turns out, all the models were saying he clearly should have gone for it, he chooses to, to be conservative and to punt. And I understand it was at his own 32, but he's playing the Kansas City Chiefs in the Super Bowl, his, you know, it's fourth and two. This team has an incredible success rate on fourth down and he chooses to punt. And then after the game, obviously he couldn't have predicted that Kadarius Tony was going to 
return the, the punt to the four yard line and then that his defense would just mess up for the second time in a row and give up, you know, another walk in touchdown. But just the decision itself, even if that hadn't happened, it was it was a coach. And he said after the game, you know, no coach would have gone for it in that situation. You're supposed to be the one who's not doing just what everyone else would have done, but listening to the data. And in that situation, I felt personally that that was a situation where you go by what the data says, not what the conventional wisdom says. Even though I could debate in other situations, that one I felt well, was very clear. I, I think the other part of that is when you think about that particular decision, the data may have supported it, but what also would have supported going for it, first of all, like you said, Kansas City can go up and down the field. But second of all, you don't play against type in the Super Bowl. You don't play against what you are mm -hmm. in the Super Bowl. If you're the most aggressive team in the NFL on fourth down, you can't suddenly be conservative on fourth down in the Super Bowl. You just you you can't play against type. So so that that's an interesting one. But, uh, you know, it's it is interesting because, you know, we can talk about analytics and we can debate situations. But it is something that I hope that Big Blue View readers are enjoying because it's it's a dive into numbers, the stuff that you've been writing that's that's different. Than, than anyone else brings to our staff. And that, for me, that is something that I try to do. I try to bring different strengths and different skills and different perspectives to the site. So I hope people are enjoying it. So I think Tony Del Genio does bring a lot of that in, in his own way. Um, it's He takes a little bit of a different angle on it than I, I might. But, I, you know, I've been enjoying reading his articles about, you know, about the Giants compared to the Vikings, but it's a pretty, you know, analytical analysis, not just a, uh, not just a, you know, an opinion one or things like that. Well, he's um, a retired engineer, so he, he yeah. loves the data and he loves the research. Yeah, he no, so he's, he, you know, you already had, you already had someone who was doing a pretty good job of that. Um, I hope I, you know, I, I hope I'm that people can enjoy it and contribute. Sometimes I can go a little bit too nitty gritty. Um, I try to limit that more to the Jets site because that's their that's that niche. Whereas Big Blue View is more of a uh, you know an overall site trying to do many different things. So I'm not gonna totally geek out on it, but I hope that the information that I have put in there is at least something to think about or a different little bit of a different angle. Um, and during the regular season, a lot of times what I like to do is look into the strengths and weaknesses of a team based on the data that you know that might not necessarily be evident just by, you know, looking at the raw statistics. Yeah, man, and I'm hoping that one of these days, I'm hoping, I mean, there's, you know, there's some data from next gen stats and ESPN has created some of its own, you know, some of its own proprietary data. And I'm not always 100% sure how valuable or how valid some of that is, but I'm hoping someday that we have something other than pro football focus to uh to lean on i'm i'm just curious as a as a data person as an analytical person i mean i'm curious you know what you think of pro football focus and and, and how you try to use it so you know i wrote a whole uh screed on linkedin actually about my idea of pff which is, you know, kind of that it was a, it's a good idea and there are some good things there. The execution is still not quite there yet. And I, th I think, I suspect that one of the reasons is simply because that the people who are doing the grading for them are just not, you know, it, it, you know it, th this is kind of necess necessarily, like, meaning you cannot pay hundreds of people to be doing analysis. You can't be, you, you know, in film review, you can't be paying them the kind of money that someone who is really good at this would be paid. So for example, a lot of the people that they use are, are high school and college kids, not to say that high school and college kids don't, can't have knowledge, but just chances are, you know, they're, they're, they're not necessarily the people who are doing the grading aren't necessarily the level of X's and O's as let's say, you know, um, some of the big blue view guys are, um, you know, with their, with their film analysis. So, the way the grades end up, sometimes you look at a grade and you say that makes no sense comparing to what we actually saw. And even you even sometimes see it when it comes to the data that they actually collect. You know, especially if you cover a team very well, you, you're, fam you're more familiar with what goes on. So you look at certain numbers and you say, how does that make any sense? 
And you realize it's because it's, it's likely, you know, football, especially is there's so much that you have to kind of guess from what you see and you're not in the huddle and you don't know the assignment, but the better that someone actually knows what they're talking about and how, you know, and knows football and maybe even has played football at some level, the more they're going to be able to be accurate with even just collecting statistics. So that my biggest thing with PFF right now is I think it's a good concept. I just wish, first of all, I wish it would be a little bit more transparency and specific plays and how they were graded. Um, I found last year that they put out explain the grade and at least some of them did not, did not make it any more, any clearer to me about how it was graded or why things were graded a certain way. So I, I think, again, that there, there, there's definitely room for improvement there, but with certain positions, especially, it's really the only thing we have. Yeah, that's specifically. That's one of the things that, that I try to tell people we reference it. And I, I find some of their, their, what they call signature stats. Some of that data to me is more useful because it's a larger context mm -hmm. than, it, than it is to, to look at their grades their mm -hmm. player grades per se. You know, I, I tell people all the time because we use, you know, pro football focus grades in a lot of our stories. It's a guide. It's, it's a data point. It's for discussion. Don't come at me and tell me that player a is better than player B because player a has a 70 grade and player B has a 62 grade. Don't come and tell me that that makes you know that, that makes the first player better than the second player, mm -hmm. because that person doing that grading has no idea, as you said, what the guy's assignment was on given plays and and, and how he, and how he's taught, you know, to uh, to execute certain plays. So don't come and tell me that because player A has a, a a PFF grade just a few points higher that he's a better player than player B. I mean, and I think Bill Belichick once said it. I don't remember in what context, but he said, there's no way you could have known who blew that assignment unless you were in the huddle because it could have been any one of a few players. Even, even if you look at the defense and you think it would have been a certain way, it really just depends. We call it the same defense with different players having that assignment. So you can try to give a guess, but you don't know. You right. really don't know. And that, that's a lot of the times you see it, and particularly with safety play, you see it a lot, where you don't know what that safety was meant to be doing. So, well, the, 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 you know, the, the, the cornerback gets blamed for something when he was expecting the safety to be there or things like that. And yeah, it's complicated. It's very, very easy to look at coverages. As you said, it's very, very easy to look at a, at a, at a blown coverage per se and blame the closest defender. Which is what next gen stats does. When it, when it may not be, have had anything to do with the closest defender and you know that cornerback who winds up being the closest defender may have simply recognized the screw up in the coverage and been the one to try to react and wound up being the closest one there to cover somebody else's breakdown so very very difficult especially the way that nfl teams try to hide coverages now try to you know try to to rotate guys into different places and, and disguise what they're trying to do. Oh, absolutely. And it, you know, it is definitely one of the limitations and it may always be one of the limitations of analytics. Um, you know, there, there obviously is a long way to go. I think there's still a lot of things that can be done to improve. Um, I happen to think, you know, a lot of next gen stats is based on models, you know, based on that chip and the ball and the, and the, and the dots of where every player is. I think that they might do a better job by um, training some sort of AI model on, you know, the last who knows how many years of, fo of football games and actually creating models based on that rather than creating models based on the dots. That's, that's my personal opinion. I think that doing something like that would probably give you a more accurate description of where a player should have been, even though it wouldn't be perfect. I think mm -hmm. it would be better. You know, I'm not about the feasibility of that. I'm not commenting on. I'm just saying that I've, from what I see from Next Gen Stats, some of the things that I've seen from there, and I've actually even spoken to some of the people who are involved in ESPN Analytics also, and I said, you know, what about this player that makes no sense? Like, watch the guy. He stinks, and he's rated one of the top run defenders in the league or something like that. Right. Um, so, you know, it, it's I, I, you know, I, I have my, I definitely see the limitations in analytics, and I think 
that's kind of where you, there is no substitute for film study. Right. Absolutely. And there's no substitute for, you know, the, the, the more you watch, the more you understand, the more you study and it, it, it all goes into a big pot, you know, and, and I think as you try to figure out, you know, who's a good player and who isn't. I mean, that, that's, that's also very interesting. You know, the more you get into analytics and the more you get into film, the more you, you sometimes wonder, do I even really know who's good? Like, there are some players, like you watched Dexter Lawrence last year. There was no question about it. I mean, the, the guy was a, was a beast. You know, you watched him and he was just, he was, you know, and, and the fact that he was so dominant and yet the Giants, you know, defense struggled so much was just, was that much more incredible. But when you watch, for example, um, you know, some of the linebackers or Dory Jackson, you know, you know what the stats say about them, but I'm like, okay, so how good is he really? I cannot tell because some of the players next to him aren't that great. And some of the, you know, there's also they're That's- rotating on and off in their, in their defense. And it becomes, the more you know, sometimes it, it feel, you feel more and more like maybe the guy is good in that scheme. Let's say free agents in particular, you're trying to figure out who would be good for this team. It's very hard to tell. It, it, it can be. And it's, in, it's very interesting that you mention you know, the guy next, the guy next to me. Because that is incredibly true when it when it comes to especially when it comes to offensive line yeah, play. It's I can remember, and this is this is going back a ways. I can remember Will Beatty for the mm-hmm. Giants, left tackle, pretty good player. Mm-hmm. Signed a big contract. I think this was after the 2012 season. Mm-hmm. Had a miserable 2013 season, worst season of his career. People were saying the Giants never should have spent that money and this and that and the other thing. And, you know, BD ended up more or less flaming out of the league due to injuries. Mm -hmm. But I kept saying, you know, he's playing next to James Brewer. And James Brewer doesn't even want to be there. (laughs) <laughs> you know, he's playing next to James Brewer. You know, give the guy a break. He's he's trying to block for two people. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, he spent most because the Giants were an injury riddled mess on the offensive line. And it, it definitely impacts the guy next to you definitely impacts, you know, what you uh, you know, how you perform. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, that, and that's something that analytics can't very often can't account for. Right. Um, you know, right. it's, it's interesting. I actually asked ESPN because I was, I was curious about their pass rush win rates that from ESPN specifically, not, not pro football focuses. So I asked um, one of the guys who, who works, works at ESPN, just, you know, how does so this player end up with this pass rush win or, or pass block win rate? Yeah, pass block win rate, win rate. I asked him, how do you end up with an average rate when he was clearly below average? He said, well, he had one of the highest double team rates in the league. So he was a lot of times joining in with someone else. So he has an average pass rush win rate. Well, maybe we should try to combine those in some way to say how often did he win when he was isolated one-on-one versus when he was double teamed? That, you know, that that makes a big difference. And, how, and also this from film study if a guy comes clean, you have to do your best to figure out who it was who blew that and not just credit it to no one because right. because because then you end up with off the worst offensive lineman with decent grades because they're not getting they're not getting blamed for just complete flops that they made. Absolutely. Hey, let's let's finish up here mm-hmm. and I'm going to finish up with a we're going to get off analytics and I'm going to finish up with a Jets question. Sure. All right. Aaron Rodgers, Mm -hmm. he's turning into a party boy. He's at the Tony Awards. He's at Taylor Swift. He's at all the concerts. He's everywhere. He's enjoying life in New York City and in New Jersey and all of that. This is only going to go one of two ways with the Jets and Aaron Rodgers. It's going to be glorious or it's going to be a complete and utter disaster. What's it going to be? So if I answer the latter, um, some of my Jets people will probably scream at me. You know, as a hardened Jets fan, it's very hard to think that it's going to be anything other than a disaster. <laughs> you know, from a, from, a, from a football perspective, 
it, you know, it, so much of it depends on their offensive line. That's really the problem. And their offensive line, if you think the Giants' offensive line has a wide d- difference between their ceiling and floor, just look at the Jets. That offensive line has one of the biggest – you know, possible out range of outcomes. So if their offensive line, I, I really believe this, that ultimately if their offensive line plays well, they will be one of the most likely to be one of the, one of the top teams in the, in the AFC, at least in, if their offensive line does not play well and plays and, you know, they have, even if they don't have the same injuries, they just have the level of poor performance that they had, you know, even anything close to what they had last year, their season is going to go down the drain. <laughs> Yeah, it's always uh, – it, it'll be interesting. We'll see what happens uh, this season when the Jets and the Giants play. And, and in that, the That'll be a wrong. very interesting matchup, actually, because of how the Giants like to blitz and the Jets have, have had a lot of trouble in the past picking up um, blitzers, picking – especially, like, if you're going to try to stunt or things like that. They've had a lot of trouble with that. Um, and then the Giants also with Daniel Jones as a running quarterback or a quarterback who, you know, who has, has a lot of talent with his legs. The Jets struggled with those. Yeah, it's, uh, it'll be interesting. We'll see how it goes. Rivka, thank you very, very much for spending the time. I hope you're, I hope you're enjoying Big Blue View. I hope your boss at that site isn't driving you too crazy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate the time that you've spent with me, especially uh, when we just get to discuss random things. Um, about the Giants, about football. Uh, I've, I've definitely learned a lot already, and I'm, I'm very much enjoying it. So thank you, and thank I, you for taking the time. I, I know that the readers are enjoying your stuff. So, uh, so thanks again for the time. Giants fans, thank you as always for listening. Please remember to stay safe out there, take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.